Welcome to Talking Buffalo, featuring conversations with guests from around the world of sports, media, pop culture, and all things Buffalo, with your host, Patrick Moran. All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo Sports Talk and more. Today's episode is brought to you by SimTurf. Going to be doing some really cool golf content stuff on the show real soon. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about SimTurf a little bit later in the show. But anyway, hope all is well. Big thank you as always to everybody out there for watching, for listening, for following, for subscribing. I appreciate you all very much very much. Uh, this is our weekly pod bag episode. This of course is the episode where you, the audience, you control the narrative, you control the topics, your takes, your comments, your questions that we pulled featured on today's show. And I will be reacting to them. I say it every week. I'll say it again. If you want to be a part of this show going forward, you want your question and your take featured On this episode, this pod bag episode, there's a few ways to do it. You could leave a comment on any of the YouTube videos on the video side. Every episode is available besides the audio on the YouTube side. So leave a comment there. We will pull some of the good ones for submission for this show. You can also tweet at me at Patrick Moran TV, or you can email Talking Buffalo Podcast at Gmail. Dot com. Not going to waste any time. This is a, uh, not a ton of questions, but some really or comments, but a bunch of really good ones that I'm looking forward to talking about. And I'll tell you another thing that I'm very much looking forward to today is actually being able to dive into some Buffalo Sabre stuff. This pie bag episode has almost been a Buffalo Bills weekly mailbag and we got some Bills stuff. So we will talk some Bills as well today, but I got a few really interesting Buffalo Sabres observations that I want to comment on a couple other fun things as well as the, at the end, again, not going to be a very long show. So let's just actually dive in right now. I want to start right away with S I S underscore Matt, who says, looks like your boy Tone pucks is going to be right about Jeff Skinner. Good call and props. All right, so for those who may be new to the show or just missed the episodes that I've had on over the last few months with Tone Pucks, he has been pretty adamant that the Buffalo Sabres should and ultimately will buy out Jeff Skinner. Whether it's a buyout or trade, he's been convinced for quite a while now that Jeff Skinner has played his last game with the Buffalo Sabres. It appears that Skinner being bought out could come to fruition. Hell, I'm recording this Tuesday around lunchtime-ish. There's at least a small chance you might listen to this sometime on Wednesday or maybe later on Thursday or so where this might already be officially a done deal. And it's newsworthy to me. Well, it's newsworthy for a ton of reasons, but as it pertains to this specific show and where the commenter SIS underscore Matt is talking about is up until now, up until recently where the buzz started growing. And I know Elliot Friedman on 32 thoughts is his podcast talked about this credible, reputable Buffalo Sabres journalists after credible, reputable Buffalo Sabres journalists have surmised that Skinner being bought out. It's not going to happen this year, maybe next year. Biggest reason being, if the Sabres buy him out, they're going to be paying for him for the next six years instead of the next three. Tell Pucks on this show more times than I could count has been pounding, and I mean pounding the table for a Jeff Skinner buyout. Not just pounding the table for it, but actually continuing against, again, what everybody's been saying, um, advocating that it's going to happen. And uh, I actually want to play a clip here. It's about a two-minute clip or so. It's from an episode. And if you want to 
a little bit of perspective on how far Tone's uh, disdain for, for I don't want to say for Jeff Skinner as a person, but the, the, the player that Jeff Skinner is with the Buffalo Sabres. I'm going to play a clip, and this is going all the way back to March 27th. So we're talking literally almost three months ago on this show, uh, Tone was pounding the table and just went off the rails a little bit. And again, if you if you watch the episodes with Tone Bucks, this is the kind of style uh, that you're going to get when him and I get together uh, for a show. But anyway, let me uh, let me pull this up. Let me play this clip, come back. And then I got a couple comments of my own about uh, Jeff Skinner. But anyway, this is Tone Pucks. I got to get to it and press play. Here we go. You know, they tease people statements like this. There's a fucking reason why Jeff Skinner hasn't been to the playoffs. He's been a, a you know, a central figure and an important player on two teams that have not been very good, all right, with him, with him. He's part of the problem, man. He is 100% Part of the problem. Now, look, man. If Tate Thompson were a better two-way center, then I could deal. Then I could get away with Jeff Skinner, but he's not. All right, Tate Thompson is not a good two-way center. He's a shitty number one center. If you want to know the truth, everybody's ecstatic because we got him for like seven mil and some change. Well, you know what? I know you know he had the he had the big goal scoring year, but. It's not looking like quite that bargain anymore. If anything, it's looking like a little bit of an anchor. So is Cousins' contract, but you're stuck with them. You're just you're stuck with them. So it's the guys on the fringe that you got to find the replacements for. And one of them is Jeff Skinner. Yeah. One of them is undoubtedly Jeff Skinner. And I don't care if you got to eat four or five for a couple years. You hold off on somebody's extension then. God forbid this fucking guy... Adams holds off on somebody's extension. <laughs> Everybody's getting seven million, nine million, Thompson seven, Cousins seven, Power seven, Rasmus like nine, then eleven. Jesus Christ, hold on for a minute. Yeah. Hold on for a minute. <laughs> I look, I again I'd suggest I saw the practice lines on Tuesday, and I and he was on the third line, and Greenway was on the first line. I said, why is this guy not being bought out? And again, I got dragged for it. Informational purposes. By who? Lots of fans. Other than guys, the only way to get dragged for Skinner being sent packing or bought out is if you truly feel as though they're going to regret the, the salary cap ramifications of what they have to eat. You know, what they have to eat. Other than that, getting dragged because Jeff Skinner's belongs on this team or is part of the solution is fucking bananas land. He is lazy, lazy, lazy. All right. And he, he's just, he's, he's a complete non-factor. He is a complete non-factor when it comes to winning hockey games. I, I, man, dude, being a Jeff Skinner fan uh, is beyond me right now. I mean, this guy is just his fall from grace. Uh, is is very, very evident. And unless they change coaches and somebody says, I'm going to get Jeff Skinner a two-way center so I don't have to worry about the fact that Jeff Skinner don't give two fucks about defense, all right, unless you're finding that sort of center for him, then he's got to go. He's got to go. All right, that was Tom Fox all the way back on March 27th. And I actually got another one armed that I'm going to play in a minute as well pertaining to more specifically Skinner being bought out. This one was from May 3rd. And look, I'm going to be honest with you. The purpose of it is maybe taking a little bit of a victory lap, but also for, for people out there beyond just Buffalo Bills fans who are looking to get some honest, maybe admittedly overly emotional insight with the Buffalo Sabres. That's the kind of stuff you're going to get on this show here, talking Buffalo and more specifically uh, when I have Tone Bucks on. But anyway, back to Jeff Skinner, all in all likeliness being bought out. And here's Tone Bucks talking about, and this is about a two minute clip or so. This is Tone Bucks talking about that possibility and him predicting it going all the way back to 
the very beginning of May. Do you feel like Lindy Ruff will have a short leash with a player like Jeff Skinner? And I would think that maybe that was at least a conversation that Kevin Adams had before hiring Lindy. Not that Jeff Skinner would be the, you know, the ultimate basis of him hiring him or not, but had to at least been a conversation. Like I this guy's our third liner. He don't play no defense. He's gone. I think he's gone. I think it's the fact that people, all right, are, are, uh, are pushing back on that and just not as open to it is crazy to me. It's crazy to me. You know, I don't like to make Sabres and Bills comparisons, certainly not on the basis of, you know, them being uh, tied by the common owner. But, you know, we just saw what the Bills were willing to do to walk away from someone that wasn't an organizational fit. Right. I, I have no reason to think that the Sabres wouldn't be willing to do the same. And the fears that people have on the money side, okay, I, I would ask them to look a little bit deeper as to, you know, what we've been doing with our money over the past few years and who's out there to pay in the next next few. There's really nobody, all right, who's going to break our bank in the next few years of Eaton Skinner's contract. All those guys are signed already. Darlene Powers, um, Power, I think I may have put an S on that inadvertently. Power. Cousins, um, Tage. Cousins, Tage. So, there's just, like, you know, you're more apt to miss out on being able to do something with Skinner's nine on the books and him in the lineup than you are with, a dead five or six in the lineup. It actually makes perfect sense. And I just, I'm, I'm going to die on this hill, man. They're doing it. Well, there you go. I mean, it remains to be seen if it, when it does happen, I would think if it's going to happen, it might be real soon. And again, maybe even at a time, you're listening to this uh, to this podcast. And, you know, it sucks. It sucks that it comes to this. Jeff Skinner, Buffalo Sabre for six years, 427 games. Uh, he scored 153 goals, including 40 in 2018 and 2019, which in fairness to the Sabres organization, because I blast them a lot and it is deserved. And if you think, I'm exaggerating that statement. Just wait about three or four minutes here. But in defense of the Sabres, you got a guy in Jeff Skinner who you trade for, and then he pops in 40. And he's going to be a free agent. He did it, and then he gets paid. Eight years, $72 million. Now that seems fucking absurd, but... At that time, after dropping, you know, scoring 40 goals, you're kind of hamstrung. Like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? He parlayed a career year into an eight-year contract. And it's not like his goal production has been complete shit. I mean, he had 33 goals in 2021 and 2022. He had 35 the next year. Uh, the problem is, Kind of what Tone was talking about. If he ain't scoring, he's useless because he ain't playing no defense. He's not playing any defense and he's expensive as hell. Expensive as hell. Buying him out sucks because you're going to pay for six years and that third year you're going to get hit real hard. But man, to kind of like what Tone was talking about, manageable cap hits and that will free up some money to, to do something else in free agency or trade. And also, you know, it creates a path, whether it's Savoy, whether it's Kulik, Rosine, who knows, but that's a Ford who will now have a path assuming that Jeff Skinner ultimately is gone. It's just insane that it's come to this. And it just kind of feels like you just know, you just know that Jeff Skinner is ultimately going to get bought out, probably, if not traded. He, 
Jeff Skinner is not playing another game for the Buffalo Sabres. I agree with Tone Pucks. And again, to Tone Pucks' credit, he's been shouting that from the mountaintops now for quite literally months. I think Jeff Skinner's played his last game, but you just know he's going to end up somewhere and win a fucking Stanley Cup. Casey Middlestead, literally just as I was about to record this, just signed a three-year contract with Colorado. I think 5.75 annual average, something like that. He don't win a Stanley Cup. You know he's going to win a cup. Hell, best case scenario, let Skinner go to Colorado because then him and Casey Middlestad, they can win a Stanley Cup together. And at least it'll be two guys on the same team. But Christ, man, it, it sucks to see this come down to it with Jeff Skinner. But especially Lindy Ruff here, who's going to be accountable. He's going to... He, Jeff Skinner got away with it the last couple of years. He, that, that's over. And I think that's why he's gone with Lindy Ruff being the head coach. And with J.J. Baturka kind of blossoming last year and looking really good on that first line with Tage Thompson and with uh, Alex Tuck, to me, that was kind of like the final nail for Jeff Skinner. Again, not official as I record this anyway, but fully um, expecting that to happen. All right, let's move on. Tom says, still can't believe you were rooting for Edmonton after their head coach, by the way, it's Chris Knobloch, uh, took a stab at the Buffalo Bills. I'm glad Florida won. All right, real quick context here. If you don't know uh, what Tom's talking about, uh, Chris Knobloch was talking about being in the cup for the first time and, you know, just being uh, raw and not having that experience. And he talked about the Bills being in the several, four straight Super Bowls and losing them all. So it was kind of, you know, it was definitely a dig at the Bills. I don't give a shit, though. I don't give a shit what Knobloch said. I did not want the Florida Panthers to win the Stanley Cup for a couple of reasons. Number one, I hate hockey in Florida. And I'm sorry, Tampa fans and Miami, Florida fans. I hate it. I do. I really do. But even more than that, the last thing as a Sabres fan, and I am a Sabres fan, I'm an angry Sabres fan, a, a very frustrated, on the brink Sabres fan, but I still am one. The last thing on earth that I wanted to see was more Buffalo Sabres, former Buffalo Sabres leave this organization and win a fucking Stanley Cup. And that is literally what just happened. It is embarrassing to me. Embarrassing. And it should. And if it's not embarrassing to the Sabres organization, it certainly should be. But just to see more ex Sabres Win a Stanley Cup this week. Sam Reinhardt, Kyle Ocposo, uh, Rodriguez, Montour, on a lesser extent. I don't really give a shit much about Rodriguez or Montour. But those first two, Sam Reinhardt, Kyle Ocposo, to me, it just, that sucks. It, it, it's good for them, and they're good people, and they don't deserve to be vilified because they left the Buffalo Sabres. Obviously, that's, you know, I think that's, universally accepted with Kyle Lock Post. So there's a lot of people out there who like to hate on Sam Reinhardt. I ain't one of them. Shit just didn't work out. He was frustrated, didn't want to be here at one point, didn't want to pay him. At one point, he leaves. Bam. Stanley Cup. So now he joins the crew. You know, Ryan O'Reilly goes to the St. Louis Blues, wins the Stanley Cup, helps lead them to the Stanley Cup, wins the Conn Smythe Trophy for playoff MVP. Jack Eichel, of course, goes to Vegas a key figure in Vegas winning the cup just two years ago. And now Sam Reinhardt. 50 goal score on the season. Scores the game winning goal in game seven of the Stanley Cup. Sam Reinhardt, because of course, because of course Florida was going to win by one goal. And because of course it was going to be former Buffalo Saber, former Saber core player, Sam Reinhardt scoring the game winning goal. Just unbelievable. Then you got Kyle Ocposo, you know, not a great player. Certainly not anymore. Hasn't been in, in quite a long time. But he wanted a cup in Buffalo so bad. Goes to Florida. And a couple months later, he's skating around the ice holding the Stanley Cup. If you're watching on the video side, or at least uh, if you've seen the thumbnail of it, the graphic for this episode is literally an ecstatic Kyle Ocposo skating around, hoisting the Stanley Cup up over his head. Just unbelievable, man. It's um, this organization. And by the way, you know, I go back to that 
2017, 2018. It's just crazy to me that the Sabres had Jack Eichel, Sam Reinhardt, and Rylan O'Reilly as the core of this team. Not to mention, you know, he might be a shithead, but Evander Kane was on this team. A much, much younger Kyle Ocposo was on this team. You had Robin Leonard and Nett, who played great before and after Buffalo. Uh, Linus Olmark was, was the backup. It's just, this roster, it's insane. It's insane. Phil Housley was the coach. They won 25 games that year with Eichel, with Reinhardt, with O'Reilly, with Olmark, or it's not Olmark, but Leonard, with Kane, so many other good players. It is insane to me. This reminds me of an episode I did back in February. And it's kind of triggered me a little bit because watching Sam Reinhardt and Kyle Ocposo and Rodriguez on my tour or whatever, win a Stanley Cup. It reminds me that the Buffalo Sabres, I think, are the worst organization right now in pro sports, period. Pro sports, period. I think they are the worst organization in sports. They're not the worst team year after year, although they've been the worst team, I think, what, four times during the drought? They've had the dead last record at uh, most least points in the whole NHL. Insane. Insane. The worst organization, man. They, they, they suck on the ice. They don't make the playoffs on the ice. And then time after time after time, key players don't work out here. They leave and they go on to enjoy way more success, individually and team success, when they leave. Uh, one question kind of related to this, um, and then I want to get to a break. But at Coop DeVille says, do you watch baseball? The A's are the worst organization in sports and is not close. They lose on purpose to make fans not show up so they can move the team without a fight. All the Sabres need to do is find the right combination of GM and coaching staff, and that'll make them a winner. <laughs> I'll say this. I started laughing when I read that because I instantly started thinking of the movie Major League when, you know, the owner wanted the Indians to lose on purpose so that they would move. And there's some truth to that. Look, off the, off the field in terms of commitment to winning, absolute freaking joke the Oakland A's are. Where are they going to Vegas now or something like that? I don't even know. I know they're leaving, but I, I get that. But they're not the worst organization in sports because of history, recent history. You know, Oakland made the playoffs in 2020. Oakland made the playoffs in 2019. Oakland made the playoffs in 2018. The Oakland A's had a winning record as recently as 2021. If you want to see over the last 24 months, maybe 36 months, the Oakland A's are the worst organization in sports. Sure. We'll have that discussion. Oakland A's, New York Jets, Buffalo Sabres. Let's sit at that table. But this is not just a three-year thing, and you cannot count the Oakland A's as the worst organization in sports over the last 10 to 15 years when they quite literally made the playoffs three consecutive years as recently as four years ago. No way. No how. And sure, in theory, the Sabres just need the right combination of GM and coaching staff that'll make them a winner. How many years, how many GMs, and how many coaching staffs have we been saying that for now? Just nuts. Just nuts. I, I appreciate the take, by the way. I really do. And look, Oakland is a, a clown show right now for sure. But they are not the worst organization in sports. Certainly not over, you know, the last uh, decade or so. But anyway, I'm going to take a real quick break. Come back. Some more questions, comments, and takes from you on this episode of the pod bag. All right, we are back here on this week's episode of the pod bag. So far, it's been all savers, and I got another one for you, man. Um, at MT Scott 2 says, the savers have been horribly run. By the way, I'm not alone. As you can tell, there are a lot of annoyed Buffalo Sabres fans out there right now, just because a, the team was such in colossal flop this year, but it's almost like a kick in the nuts to watch the Florida Panthers and Sam Ryan, Arden and also when those guys win a Stanley cup. But anyway, at MT Scott zero two says the Sabres have been horribly run for most of their existence. The only reason they were good in the early two thousands 
is because the team was already built for the new rule set after 2006 and seven. They fumbled that great team apart and have had awful management and decisions since. And prior to that, they were good because of having the best goalie of all time. And before that, there wasn't a salary cap, so players couldn't decide where to go. All right, thank you for that uh, the comment, MT. Look, they were great in the, May two, in the mid-2000s. That was a great team. I don't think you could take that away from, from Darcy. They built an outstanding team, and it was built to last. Man, they had a really good run. It feels like a crime that that team never won the Stanley Cup. I mean, in part, you're right. Because they did fumble that away between Briere and Drury and then others and over the next couple of years, that uh, aspiring dynasty completely fell apart. Now we're left with what we've seen for the last 13 years. But that was a great team. Um, you know, yeah, I, I don't think you could take that away from them. You, you can't say because they were already built for the new rule set. I give credit for building for the new rule set. I, I would answer back to you. I do agree for the most part, though, about those Dominic Hasek era teams. Like, to me, the Buffalo Sabres were a mid-team in those days. But they had the best goaltender on the face of this earth. Arguably the greatest goaltender to, to ever play in the NHL, quite frankly. So, sure, I'll buy you that. But, again, they have the goalie. And they were good during that era. So I, I don't think you could sit there and say that the Sabres have been awful throughout, you said, most of their existence. Horribly run, because that's actually the words you use. Hmm. Got to give you that. They definitely, I mean, we see it now more than ever, but back in the Jory Breer days, for sure. Hasek days, eh, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's a, that, that's a tough one, but I, I appreciate the comment. Uh, let's switch to uh, some Bills stuff here. At Sue Ann Falvey 7408 says, do you think that Ray Davis will give us some help, meaning the Buffalo Bills? He seems to be very strong. That could help our Bills. What are your thoughts? Uh, I like Ray Davis a lot. I was a little, you know, in the moment, real-time reaction during the draft. I didn't love them taking a running back. I think in part because it's not even how I feel about James Cook. And I feel pretty good about James Cook. I want to see him be a little more reliable in the passing game, which is funny because his greatest skill set coming out of college was in the passing game as a receiver coming out of the backfield. But last year we saw him drop at least three, probably four touchdowns. So that aside, I still like him. But my thing was, I really, really liked what I saw from Ty Johnson last year once Joe Brady took over as offensive coordinator. And uh, I was a little surprised to see them use a fourth round pick, uh, you know, an early day round or day three pick on a running back for that reason, because I really like Ty Johnson. But as I've gotten to know Ray Davis and his skill set and what he should bring to the table. Yeah, I think it's a great move. Look, James Cook has two years left on his contract. Um, he's never been, even though he was last year, he never was a feature running back at any point, not even his college career, let alone the NFL. So I think a guy like Ray Davis could come in and play 30, maybe up to 40% of the snaps once he gets acclimated and, you know, proves his worth. He had a tough runner between the tackles. Finds the end zone. He did that a lot of Kentucky. That's something that James Cook hasn't done really much of. In fairness to him, often didn't get the opportunity because you get inside the two-yard line and it's Josh Allen territory, which is fine. But um, yeah, I like, I definitely like the move. Uh again, in the moment, I was like, you know, let's go get a corner or let's go get another edge rusher or no. Definitely another wide receiver. At the time, I was pounding the table for a wide receiver double dip in this draft. So I'm sure most of you were as well. But yeah, man, I like I like Ray Davis plenty. And um, might not be week one, but I actually think he's going to bring plenty to, uh, to this football team. So I'm pretty excited about him. At, a couple more left here, by the way. As Maz Bids says, there's no way I could believe 
that the safety group is going to be better this year until I see it with my own eyes. Edwards was average in Kansas City and only got the opportunity to start because their starter was injured. And Rapp didn't look good last season at all. He seems to be the type that has athletic ability, but isn't very intelligent. All right, well, thank you for that comment, Maz. Ah, I guess, what what are you comparing Edwards and Rapp to? Are you comparing Edwards and Rapp to, and not that you're comparing them, by the way, the, the commenter, but Micah Hyde, Jordan Poyer, three years ago, elite safety tandem, or uh, is the is the bar going to be last year's 2023 Micah Hyde, Jordan Poyer? Because last year's Micah Hyde, Jordan Poyer, I would say was mid. I've used that word twice now today. And I hate that word, mid. But that's what they were. I thought Micah Hyde definitely lost his fastball. He lost a step. He was not the same player last year. Let's just call a spade a spade here. Jordan Poyer, I thought he was pretty, I thought he played pretty well. I thought he stepped up at times in the back half of the season. He was one of the few players on defense that did anything to make a play against the Chiefs in that playoff loss. But his best days are behind him. He knows that. Um, yeah, look, I don't love I don't love Mike Edwards, but he's a relative, I think he's a solid. Solid safety and certainly not spectacular. I like the fact that he's a winner. I think this team needs more guys who have been winners in the playoffs because that, that is lacked. And Mike Edwards is a winner. He won a Super Bowl with the Chiefs. He also won a Super Bowl with the Rams. He's going to try to become, along with Vaughn Miller, the first player to win a Super Bowl with three teams. He knows what it takes to get it done. He's not a spectacular player. He's not an elite player. Not a great player. He's a pretty good player. Could have done a lot worse. As for Taylor Rapp, I agree for the most part. I didn't think he was very good, you know, for last most of last season. But, man, oh, man, that Miami game, when it mattered most, he stepped up. He made a couple huge plays to close out that Miami win at Hard Rock Stadium, including the game clinching interception, which unfortunately he got hurt on, missed the playoffs, and his presence, I think, was missed in that Kansas City game. In fact, I know it was. Um, in terms of not being very intelligent, I, I know where you're getting at here. He, he does tend to play a little reckless physical style where you could see him if he's starting over the course of a full season taking some stupid penalties. And we know what that's like in Buffalo because Jordan Phillips the Buffalo Bill here for the last couple seasons. That Oliver, too, another guy who who takes too many of those. He used to be Jerry Hughes back in the day. So Bills fans are very familiar with that style of football. Look, Taylor Rapp might not even be the starter. Bottom line. They didn't draft Cole Bishop in the second round to, to sit the bench very long. I think you're going to see a training camp battle, a legit one, maybe the highlighted camp. That might be the highlighted camp, by the way. Taylor Rapp, versus Cole Bishop, who will be the starting strong safety. And even if Bishop doesn't win it out of camp, I think he'll play plenty. And I think ultimately that's going to become his job. Look, Taylor Rapp also, though, starting experience, winner with the Rams, Super Bowl winner with the Rams. So it's not like he's never started before for now. So yeah, I get it. And maybe again, we're just, we've been spoiled over the last half dozen or so years between Hyde employer with amazing safety play, but I don't love Edwards and rap, but I certainly think you could do a lot worse. Today's episode is brought to you by SimTurf. Transform your home or business, hell, even your garage into a golf oasis with SimTurf's premium synthetic turf. Since 2001, SimTurf has become the industry leader in supplying turf to many of the top names in golf, including Trackman, Callaway, TaylorMade, Ping, the Golf Channel, just to name a few. That's for good reason. They provide the absolute best synthetic turf surfaces for residential and commercial golf sims, putting greens, any mats, and indoor outdoor tee lines. I have the Easy T hybrid hitting mat myself for my homemade golf sim. 
And at this point, I couldn't even imagine hitting off anything else from realistic feedback on both good and bad shots to comfort to durability. It is the perfect hitting mat. If you're serious about building out a quality golf simulator, there ain't nothing more important than turf, and no one does it better than SimTurf. Give them a call today at 1 833 746 8873 or visit their website at www.simturf.com. SimTurf, simply the best. All right, last couple here. At Nathan Bandura says, are you surprised the Bills aren't giving David Edwards any real competition at left guard? Good question. The answer, simply put, is yes. I am surprised. Uh, I thought post-June 1st, and by the way, the Bills have, I think, around $11 million in cap space right now, so they could do something. Maybe they still do. I mean, camp don't start for a few weeks, and the regular season doesn't start until September. Let's not lose sight of that right now. But as things stand, David Edwards more or less is going to be handed the starting guard job. And it's not like he hasn't started before, by the way. He does have 45 starts with the LA Rams. Won a Super Bowl as a starting guard. Doesn't that sound familiar, by the way? Edwards, Rapp, Ed, or, um, David Edwards, Mike Edwards, Taylor Rapp, Super Bowl winners, MVS, we're going to get to in a second. Super Bowl winners here on the Buffalo Bills. I really do love that. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Anyway, look, he was that sixth offensive lineman last year. You would hear it all the time on TV. Number 76 reported as eligible. He was fantastic in that role. I don't, I don't know how much confidence I have in him as a starter at guard right now. I guess we'll have to see how things play out. Clearly the Bills do. Clearly, Cromer uh, does. Clearly, Sean McDermott does. Because if they didn't, they would have found a way. Again, we just talked about Ray Davis being a fourth-round pick. Bills could have easily taken a guard in the fourth round, and maybe that's some instant competition at training camp. And maybe something will happen at camp that we don't know about. I'm running off the Al Collins, who they say is going to start out as tackle, but he's played guard. I guess you never know. Maybe he could become competition, although I'm not confident in the net. Maybe that center, Van Granger, could have an unbelievable camp, and the Bills see something in him almost immediately, and bam, before you know it, Conor McGovern's back to playing guard. That could happen as well. But as things stand right now, no competition for David Edwards. I'm surprised. And if they do anything between now and the regular season in terms of adding a, a veteran who would be noteworthy, I think my money might actually be on, if it's not corner, it would be on guard. Um, last Bills one here. At Phillips, Will won. If MVS could take the top off the way he did with the Chiefs last year and can improve himself in the playoffs the way he did with the Chiefs, I might be on that hill with you. Hopefully he could stay healthy. All right, thanks for that, Philip. I said, and I, a hill that I would die on is that I think MVS is going to be a really good free agent signing that nobody really has thought much of now or when it happened. He's going to make this team, barring injuries or, you know, or a, a summer collapse at camp, MVS making his football team. Wide receiver four, five, two, three, whatever the hell you want to call him, don't really matter. And my, bold, and by bold, I mean really, really bold prediction that I've said on this show a couple times now is that I think MVS is going to have more receiving yards this season than Keon Coleman. And that is not, and let me repeat this, that is not an indictment on Keon Coleman. I think Keon Coleman is going to have a fine career. I just see with these veterans in a Joe Brady offense with Sean McDermott as the coach. He doesn't need to be rushed in. I feel like Keon Coleman is going to be brought along slowly and he's going to be more of a situational guy early in his career, especially early in his rookie year. So I just want to be clear on that. But my point is I like MVS. He's going to be frustrating. He's going to drop a couple passes that hit him right in the bread basket. It's going to piss you off. It's going to make you yell at Brandon Bean for signing him. 
It's not something we haven't seen before with Gabe Davis, kind of like Gabe Davis type player. Gabe Davis, a better blocker. I think MV has a little bit more of a uh, down the field vertical threat, even though Gabe Davis has had plenty of big plays during his time in Buffalo. But anyway, I, li I, I like MBS. You know, winner in the playoffs, he's played better in the playoffs. And uh, I think he's going to bring something to this uh, to this team. Do not be surprised if he ends up having a better season than most people think. Mark David says, in my mind, Ty's sit down with McDermott went the same way as the famous Tim Graham, Doug Marone confrontation of 2013. All right, quickly here, uh, for a little bit of perspective, Ty Dunn sat down with Sean McDermott at the combine. He revealed that on uh, our episode, our chat here last week on Talking Buffalo. Of course, that would be big ass news because Sean McDermott, you know, he he would have every reason in the world to hate Tyler Dunn because Tyler wrote a very, I mean, let's be frank here, a very scathing. Um, perspective on Sean McDermott. A lot of you out there call it a hit piece. I do not disagree with that. Way too much context, way too much solid journalism that went into that. Way too many sources spoke to for me to ever call that shit a hit piece. But I will say it was critical. I have said to Tyler, I thought parts of it were a little overly critical. But anyway, my whole point is this. Ty sat down with Sean McDermott and they had a conversation. It was personal. He wouldn't talk, say what it was about. It just that wasn't really about football. It was about personal stuff. And they came away with a better understanding of each other. And I give Sean McDermott a hell of a lot of credit for doing that. Anyway, I think there's a little bit of respect there because Sean wanted to meet with Tyler Dunn. This was Sean's idea, by the way, not Tyler Dunn's originally. Tim Graham, Doug Marone, not going to get into that, but most of you know Tim Graham... Doug Marone, Doug Marone hated Tim, hated the media, period, and not the same type of coach. My name's talking about on the field, but just his relationship with media and stuff as Sean McDermott. Funny point. I like it, but yeah, at the end of the day, no, nah, that's uh, those are two different things right now. Uh, Florida Vibes got two more here, by the way. At Florida Vibes, Floridian Vibes, I'm sorry, 2019. Any all time sports media draft that doesn't. Have Ed Kilgore as a selection isn't a real draft. Dude was a mainstay at Channel 2 for four decades. All right. Earlier this week, if you haven't listened or watched, go back. Uh, Monday show. Joe from Queens and I had an all-time Buffalo sports media draft. Uh, we took six people each. Ed Kilgore, who I did mention, was not drafted. But I did mention him as an honorable mention guy. I grew up on TV here. I'm old. And I grew up on local TV in the Buffalo market. Not as prominent today, and that's no disrespect to, to Matt, to Josh, to John Scott, who, by the way, will be on the show Friday this week here, um, an Imperial Pizza taping, actually. So look out for that Friday. But I love those dudes, man. They're great. They do a great job. But just not as many people watch local TV sports or news, for that matter, as they did when I was growing up. So I grew up on Rick Azar and, and Van Miller and Murph and uh, Ed Kilgore. I love Ed Kilgore. The problem is, you have a draft like that, all-time sports media. There's so many people that you want to draft, but you only got six spots. Trust me, Ed's not the only one. I talked about it on the show. Um, Sal Capaccio, I would, I wanted to draft him. Again, only six spots. Sal is amazing. He's um one of the, the nicest people in the media. Genuine good dude. He will do, he'll give you the shirt off his back. And I loved his, his trajectory to success. Old, long road, man. You know, dude was in Florida coaching for 20-some years. Comes back after all those years and now has what to him is his dream job. And how many of us get to say that we're living our dream, that we're having our, our dream job? So that, just uh, how nice he is. Does a great job on the radio. Great radio voice. One of my favorites. But again, only six people that, you are, uh, that you're able to draft. So that's tough. But anyway, yeah, props to Ed Gilgore. He was the man. Last one at Vin Mode 8. Really enjoyed the episode last week with Sarah Holland from Channel 4. Thanks for that. Thank you for that, Vin. Um, yeah, look, Sarah's awesome. It was great to, to sit down with her at Imperial Pizza. Again, that was last Friday. Go check that out if you haven't. Uh, I kind of tweeted about this, and I've 
told other people in the media, I think Sarah Holland's going to be a big, big star. She's only one in like mid twenties and she's already as polished as she is. She can hold a great conversation, brilliant mind, wonderful personality, good looking young woman. She's got the whole tool set to be successful. And I absolutely, I'd love to see her in Buffalo for the next 30 years, but you can already tell she's destined for a, uh, a big market. That's where she'll be at some point. And I'll be rooting for her. She is absolutely awesome. And so are all of you. And on that note, I'm actually going to get out of here. That's going to do it for this episode. Again, big thank you as always for watching, for listening. I'll be back. I'm going to have a new episode Thursday. And then Friday, like I said, I'm going to be Imperial Pizza, WGRZ TV, Channel 2 Sports Director, John Scott. Talk to you guys soon.